What's up guys? We are back on a project that we have shown you a few times in the past. This here is actually right under a mansard roof. So behind these cabinets are actually angled roofline walls. So one of the challenges that we had here was we originally tried to build these with white oak interiors. The doors are always going to remain the same where they were going to be this kind of hidden, blended, painted with the walls door. When we went to install the white oak boxes, they actually required a lot of fitting and fabrication here on site. And once we got everything fabricated, it turns out the hinges that we had originally tried didn't actually work for that application. So we had to kind of take a step back and revisit this entire idea. We were able to then take all the measurements, bring everything back to our shop, and fabricate cases with the angles cut in in the shop before bringing them here. These cases would be painted with the walls so that everything matched both inside and out. One of the things we had to do here was epoxy a modified mud flange to the edge of our cases so that it would overhang the actual board and then be plastered in, giving us these seamless hidden doors. Now that everything was painted, Ian and I came back today and we're able to install all the drawers, the servo drives, the hinges, get the doors mounted, and let me kind of walk you through that process. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a door on the top, and this is actually a drawer front on the bottom. So everything is touched to open. The top one is just a bloom tip-on, and the lower one is actually a servo drive, which we do not have hooked up yet. It is installed, but we still need to run power to the actual servo drive itself, so this one's not operating at the moment. But let me open it up and show you guys what we're talking about. We went ahead and added this integrated pole so that you get a nice grip on the door when you are opening it. So here's the inside. You can see the case that we had to modify around that framing. So directly behind this case is framing for the mansard roof. And we added some shelves. Because they are angled, you can't do adjustable shelves. So we went with fixed shelves just a few of them. These cabinets were really just to give the homeowners a little extra storage for items that might be seasonal, extra blankets, things like that, that they're not gonna be using too frequently. So in the lower portion, we also have the integrated pull here, but because the server drive is not hooked up, we can't use that function right now. So inside here, we have nice big 24 inch drawers, a lot of extra storage for them. And we went ahead and put two in this side as well as in the other side. So let me give you a closer look on how we actually install the drawers and the servo drive. Most of the time we're installing the slides in the shop, but in this case, we're waiting for everything to be painted before even bothering to do that. So for the lower drawer, it's a pretty typical application. We just went ahead and set our slides in on the base of the cabinet up against either side, set back at the correct distance to allow for the thickness of the door, plus the rubber bumpers to so have a nice soft closing door. For the upper drawer, this is where things start to get a little bit trickier. We're able to calculate the distance required between the two slides with the actual height of our cabinet. It's a little bit difficult to see in here, but that mansard roof does continue through the back here. This one has a little bit more room than the other side, but we wanted to keep things even, so we matched both sides. Once we had that first drawer installed, we just used some extra scraps to shim that slide up. In this case, it was 3 eighths, so we used three pieces of eighth inch material that we had lying around. Using our combo square, set the slide back to the location that it needed to be in, and install the slide from there. That ensures that we're at the proper height. We checked our slides for level, and our drawers are never going to rub because there's plenty of space between them. Now I'll take this drawer out and show you how we mounted the servo drive. So as you can see, under the servo drive, we have the cutout for our outlet box. This is where the electricians are going to run a wire from one outlet to the other outlet, giving us power for the servo drive. Once we have that set up, we'll go ahead and connect the servo drive so that it does actually work. How the servo drive works is that once you push in on the drawer, it will push this lever back just a little bit and then spring forward, pushing this drawer out. Because this case is a little bit deeper and the drawers are a little bit larger than our typical cabinets, we had to pad that servo drive off the back wall to give us the appropriate distance for that arm to actually operate and open the door. So we just used a three quarter inch piece of plywood that we had here on site to use for this pad. It's going to give us the stability required for operating that mechanism. So there's actually two more of these units that are slightly different. 
on the other side of the house. Let's go take a look at those. So right off the bat, you'll notice that these are much narrower and one here is full height while the other is maybe about three quarters of the size. The opening in the bottom is actually for a subwoofer that will slide into that space and get a screen to blend in a little bit nicer there. So up top here, similar situation. We have the push to open latches and the framing for the mansard roof. This side here, same deal, just with an added shelf since it is a little bit of a taller cabinet. So to get these push open latches, these are actually really easy to install. The only thing to be aware of is in a shelf like this where it's only three quarters, we are dealing with an almost three eighths diameter. So it's just about half that shelf thickness. So you wanna make sure you're drilling these in perfectly straight. If you go up or down slightly, you're gonna end up running through the edge of your shelf or making it too thin and fragile. These particular push opens, they actually adjust in and out. If, if I turn these, it will allow the door to either go in a little bit further or to stick out a little prouder. Since we're matching it with the wall, just a few turns to get the door to flush out with the actual wall. On the end of these push latches is a magnet that helps keep that door closed. On the door side, it has a screw with the washer. One of the quickest and easiest ways to line the two up that I have found is if you actually take the head of the screw and put it onto the magnet while the mechanism is closed, making sure it's perfectly centered on that touch latch, and go ahead and just close the door slightly so that the tip of the screw makes a mark on your door, and that's the location that you're gonna want to put your screw in. So with that, I'm able to pre-drill a small hole into the door and then add the screw and washer in the correct location. So I had mentioned the hinges and when we first built this project, the hinges were an issue. So we're able to get them to work on that side using a typical hinge, but this side where it's so much closer to the actual framing for the roof is where we ran into a lot of trouble. So what we ultimately ended up using were sauce hinges. This gave us the flexibility that we needed with the shallow depth of the hinge. It worked with our one inch thick doors and it allowed us to get the reveals that we're looking for. Since these type of hinges need to be mortised in, we were able to actually do this all in the shop ahead of time because we fabricated these cases in the shop before bringing them here into the field to install. So when we came here today, we just needed to grab the already painted door pop those hinges on, hold the door into place and screw those hinges on. So that about wraps this part of the project up. There are a few more adjustments to make, get those servo drives hooked up and then we'll pretty much be done. So if you guys have any questions, please drop those below, letting us know and make sure to hit that subscribe button and we'll catch you guys soon. Thanks for watching. Last week's video, bubble screen. <sighs> bubble screen. Got a question on YouTube and you got it through DMs. Yeah. Were the holes supposed to line up on the back and front sides? No, the holes were never supposed to line up. This was the design intent from the architect the entire time. This door is separating the living space. <clears throat> so it's a living room kitchen area mm -hmm. and the front of the house, which is the foyer and the stairs to go into the basement which they have a bunch of home offices. So they're keeping some separation between living space and office space. They, because of the size of some of those circles, they wanted to offset them to make sure that they had a little bit more privacy rather than lining them up so that everything was kind of visible. You had these almost like portholes into mm -hmm. the next room. So they decided to offset them to allow for a little bit more privacy while still allowing the colors and the shapes to kind of come through on both sides of that room. All right, I, I said the same thing when I saw it all together. You gotta jump in here, bud, so you can read these. Wow, a lot of, a lot of good. <laughs> Give me a second. While I do that, uh, were the holes on the bubble screen intentionally drawn out or were they more random and just kind of? Yeah, that's a good question. So we actually had uh, three or four renditions of patterns for the bubbles 
working uh, with the architect to kind of figure out what the smallest hole that we could edge band successfully would be and a pattern that the homeowners liked. So yeah, three or four kind of designs later, this is what everybody landed on. The holes were um, a, a good enough size for us to be able to edge band with somewhat ease. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, obviously before we kind of figured out that there was 700 and something of them and how difficult it was actually going to be, seemed easier going with the, the smaller holes. We kind of laid out the actual smallest size that we were willing to or able to edge band and let the kind of let the designers kind of run from there. It was totally up to them and they created this pretty cool bubble pattern that kind of um, goes was, diagonal, yeah. 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 All right. Um, I think that was just someone requesting to be a part of the video. Sorry, we're not taking any callers. <laughs> uh, how long till Ken and Doug share hair products? Uh, you don't have to wait. We've already, we've already shared tips with each other. What's the favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job. You know what I like is that... Besides answering questions about hair products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I, I'm going to start getting paid for that, man. Jeez. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people, I think they look at this job and they're like, oh, you just built cabinets. That's all you do. That must be boring. I kind of, I disagree. I think it's that no two days are the same, especially in our shop where we're not mass producing cabinets. It's like, sure, we get some flat panel kitchens in that are very similar. Or we get some shaker projects in that are very similar, things like that. But we're always building like new stuff or, you know, we're challenged daily. And I think finding solutions to those challenges is, is what really does it for a lot of us. And kind of being able to stand back at the end of the project, and be like, here's the picture or the rendering or the shop drawing. And that's the final product. Like I built that, I think is really fulfilling for me. And I think the same goes for a lot of the guys. I know um, I've been getting a lot of comments. I've seen a lot of comments come in about all these bubbles killing morale and you know, I think we've talked about it before too. I can't remember if it was on here, but Ian and I talked about it after, after the screen was all said and done. We did. We talked about it. I think it was actually on this video it that it aired. Yeah. Live, yeah. And you know, he's kind of in the same boat where it's like he wanted to see it through. It was challenging. It was a lot of work, but at the end of the day, it was it was his baby. You know, and he wanted to to make sure that he saw that one through. So I don't think that it it kills morale. Sure, it gets frustrating or boring or annoying at times, but morale killer? I don't think so. Yeah, and I, I'm looking forward to the install and showing that final picture to everybody. Yeah, that's going to be... Because I still think there's probably some people that can't envision exactly what it's going to be. Yep, so yeah. like once that clear goes over the walnut, once the you know plastic is peeled off of that blue and you can actually see it in the space, I think it's going to really, really be something else for a lot of people to, to actually witness. Evan Sexton, nothing good comes easy. Isn't it true? Yeah, yeah. So taking a step back, hindsight, if you could do the entire bubble screen over again, mm -hmm. how'd you do it yeah, differently? I think, I, think, um, I think that was actually a question from Matt. He, he had asked, you know, would we do the wooden, would we still get the veneer? Solid. I mean, no. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not solid, not solid. So one of the other um, options that we had discussed was basically taking the substrate over to CNC before we even veneer it, have the holes cut, but larger, and then also have basically solid walnut rings also cut. So it would be the inner diameter and the outside diameter. Mm -hmm. Drop those in place, glue them all in. Once that's, veneer on. Yeah, once that's cured, clean it up, veneer on top of it. That was another consideration. In hindsight, if I had to do another one, I don't know if I would do it that way. I, um, I think it's still, I would still have to sit down and kind of crunch the numbers, get some talk with Dovey, our CNC guy, mm -hmm. figure out how long it's gonna take because it's not fast to cut all of those circles two times, right? On the, with wood, cause you're cutting, like I said, inner and outer circles. And we have to do it thick enough so that the rings don't break account for extra and then there's a lot of solid lumber waste all the inner diameters of those and movement, right? like... yeah i mean there's still going to be some movement but with the with the solid rings like that i wouldn't be as concerned oh, with true. with movement on um you know something like that especially with having the mdf substrate right. 
and the rings would be thin enough, but you have to find that balance of what's too thin so they're not breaking. Um, you're still spending a lot of time and money with the CNC, with the solid lumber, with handwork after we still have to glue those up individually. We still have to sand the insides of those rings. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit easier because it's solid wood and we're not having to edge band it and not risking burning through. But did the solid walnut burn a lot during the CNC process? Are there a lot of chatter marks? Is there a lot of like just regular bit marks in there? Sanding the solid wood is going to take a little bit more than the edge banding. So it's this, it's a trade-off really. Would it be faster? I, I can't say for certain. Hmm. So I don't know. It would have to be a lot more thought that kind of goes into the next one and maybe a little bit of trial and error. And like we, we did it with this screen when we first started, we were edge banding it one way and then we switched after the first screen because we kind of adapted and found a faster method of edge banding those circles and um, trimming them, you know, by doing more of them up front, trimming them all later, we're able to pick up a little bit of time here. I, I think we'd have to do the same thing where we edge band a few of them that way, kind of go down that path, get all those numbers together and see what makes the most sense, both time frame wise and financially. Oh, here we go. Since joining NS Builders, what has been the most challenging project for you and why? Ooh, that's, a, that's a great one. You know, I think it's actually, oh, I know, the curved hood that we did on our um, lake drive job. Yep. That one got me. That one got the best of me. So for those who haven't been following along, that was two years ago, maybe even more now. Yeah, probably close to three. We did a, um, a curved hood, but I didn't want to make it two, what, two, two years? years, two years. Two years? Um, I didn't want to make it like a typical curved hood of the skeleton frame and you just, you know, lay a, a thin sheet over it. I wanted to actually make the whole thing a bent lamination curved hood. So it's curved on both the front and on the sides. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. I reached out to a lot of people who were much smarter than me and trying to figure out the math on making that curve making the, the, the miter on a curve because it's not just a circle, it's an ellipse, which makes adds a whole nother level of complexity to this. Mm. And needless to say, it took a lot of time, a lot more time than what any of us had expected. It seems to be the running theme in this uh, conversation here. Yep. But, you know, it's challenging. It was really challenging. Ultimately, we got it with a, a mixture of, you know, multiple machines as well as a lot of handwork. And we got it. it, it worked, it looks great, but definitely a, an absolute bear to get through. And, you know, we made a video on it. Yep. And, you know, in that video, I talked about how I wanted to try it again. And I still haven't done that, <laughs> but I do think about it. Yeah. Aside from timing, would you be concerned with telegraphing through the veneer? I think referring back. The solid wood, yeah, I mean, that, that's another concern. Um, yeah, very possible, but again, I think those pieces are so small. What is, you know, let's say 3% over three quarters. I mean, that's that's so minimal. I, I don't think that we're really going to, you would really notice a lot of that. But yes, very possible and a, a big concern. You wanna talk about that built-in process and making the decision to redo them as opposed to just making do. Yeah, um, so I think this is something we, we even covered, I think on one of the first like NS Builders podcast too, because yeah. I think it happened right around that same time. We, so basically it's the top two units of a five story brownstone, fourth and fifth floors, or I guess fifth and sixth, that doesn't matter. Um, the top floor has this angled, a mansard roof, and the interior wall, of course, is square and flat. So the homeowners wanted to add some additional storage space that they weren't really ever gonna use, just extra space to have in the space between the flat wall and the mansard roof. So we ended up with this odd angled space. Threw around a couple ideas real quick. It was just gonna be like a nothing special, just kind of get it done. 
and we we first approached it going to use some pre-finished white oak plywood white oak interiors match some of the other millwork that we had done in the house and have the doors kind of be um, painted with the walls so they blend in with the actual space and we did that we we kind of went through some of the obstacles and challenges we knew we were going to face and a lot of it was going to have to be pre-built in the field so we did that we went and got them installed only to find out that some of the hinges didn't work as well as um, a few other just kind of bumps we ran into with with fitment issues things like that ultimately it wasn't what any of us wanted me nick even james and ian uh, as well as the homeowner nobody was satisfied with them so we ripped them out all that hard work that they did ripped them out and came up with a new plan this one involved actually building the cabinetry here in the shop and then installing it in in the field using a different approach where we actually had attached a modified mud flange to the perimeter of the cases so that we could basically slide these cases into place around that angled roof line, the framing, but have that mud flange kind of come in line with the drywall, the blue board, right? So that once everything's plastered, they have a, a hard line to screed through and gave us this really sharp reveal from cabinet to wall. So when the door is open, it just looks like painted wall just turns 90 degrees. And, you know, figuring that whole thing out, finding hinges that work, the hinges were the trickiest part. Ultimately, we landed with uh, just a sauce hinge, an invisible hinge. It goes mortised into the jam, mortised into the door, and it worked great. And they look super cool and uh, happy with them. It was a struggle to get there, but this is what we had all envisioned from the start. It was just a rough road getting there. Mm. And I think that kind of ties back into the NS Builders mantra, you know. Rip it out. <laughs> if it's not right, if we don't like it, yeah, it's... You know, just making the client happy. Mm -hmm. And also, to a certain extent, being satisfied with the quality ourselves. Because sometimes the client's like, right. hey, it looks, it looks good to me. Like, it looks right. good, but it's, it's like, no, no, we got to... And uh, I think that happens more so than... than people think is a lot of it's our own personal dissatisfaction and you know we're always striving on that endless suit of perfection right so if it's not perfect or to our level it's can we fix it is it possible to fix it if not let's just rip it out and what we talk about a lot too is the sooner that we can kind of figure that out in the process the better the cheaper the faster it's going to be for everyone involved had we pulled the plug on this a little bit sooner before it got installed, you know, let's say we went through and we did all the prep work and we're about to install it. We get it all in the house. We're about to install it. We stopped there. We're like, this isn't the right, right approach. If we'd pulled the plug there, it would have saved us a lot of time and money. And you can kind of keep going back to these steps. It's like, well, how do we give it more thought on the front end instead of just like this, you know, quick and dirty project just didn't really matter. They weren't going to use it a lot. It would have saved us even more time and money and a headache, you know, but unfortunately that wasn't the case, but we made it right. And, and now we're all, we're all satisfied. All with better it. for it. Yeah. Uh, Ken has preached the same sentence to me multiple times. Father Ken knows best. It's Matt. But I think that's a, that's probably a good spot to, um, to, to rein it in. Cool. Um, so revealed. Wednesdays. If you're on YouTube, you already know that. Um, for those on YouTube, Ken, at Ken DeCost, um, recently hit 10K. I did. Give Ken a, uh, give Ken a congrats. Um, then I can start swiping up for these episodes. Next, this, will, this will be the first one. Yeah. Subscribe, follow, like, do all that stuff. And where can uh, we find you? Appreciate you guys you're just, following You're just not going to give a plug for yourself? At NSP Video. <laughs> at NSP video, Instagram. Like, follow, on his way to 10K, so make that happen by Wednesday. Wednesday evening? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. See ya.